Hello and welcome to the latest in the interview series here on Back of the Net, where we chat to former players, to managers and staff who are connected with the club or have been connected with the club in the past. Before we begin, I am pleased to introduce tonight's panel, which includes Neil Dawson. Neil, how are you? Yeah, very upbeat after last night. So uh, a bit of team spirit, what we hope for. So yeah, I'm looking forward to speaking to Lee Bradbury, who featured in our last big playoff campaign. Indeed, should be fascinating. And uh, making his debut on the interview series today is Keith Thomas. Keith, oh, how's it going? Oh, my word. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, just recovering my nerves after yesterday. So, uh, but onwards and upwards, it's going to be tough on Saturday. But hopefully we've got the team spirit right and we can go move on. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. So, on tonight's show, we have a former player and manager of the club. Uh, during a 14-year playing career, this striker made more than 500 professional appearances. He had two spells with Portsmouth and also played for Manchester City, Crystal Palace, Birmingham City, Sheffield Wednesday, Derby County, AFC Bournemouth, Exeter, Walsall, Oxford and Southend United. He scored more than 100 career goals. His first managerial post was with AFC Bournemouth, whom he led to the League One playoffs, as Neil mentioned. And after leaving us in 2012, he led Haven and Waterlooville to successive promotions, taking them from the Itzmian Premier to the National League. Currently at Crawley Town, it is, of course, none other than the Isle of Wight's first and probably only million pound player, Lee Bradbury. Bradders, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you all? Well, I can't, I can't quite recall how many clubs you played for until I read out that list. That's loads, mate. I <laughs> know, oh, yeah. I'd rather not have been that many, but um, yeah, loans, etc. after a bad injury in Portsmouth and had a few loans after that. But yeah, too many, to be honest. Well, it's, it's fantastic to have you on the show and particularly as we're in the midst of playoff fever. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes' time, I'm sure. But I wanted to start off with... Um, that sort of early life on the Isle of Wight. And um, also, interestingly, you, you had a, a military career and played for the military while stationed in Northern Ireland. What, what, what can you tell us about your early, early life in football? Um, yeah, like you say, brought up on the Isle of Wight. Um, went to Cowes High School. Went to school with Gary Rowe, the um, Millwall manager, and we managed to play in the same team together. Um, and um, Sean Cooper, obviously, off the Isle of Wight, Lewis Buxton. There's quite a few lads that have come off um, the Isle of Wight and, and made it. So um, there's a good pool for professional clubs to look into, even more so these days with the academies that are, that are running here there and everywhere. So, But yeah, good life on the Isle of Wight and um, didn't want to sort of uh, stay on the island all my life as much as it's a lovely place. I wanted to experience a bit of life and uh, I didn't quite get into the football at that stage. Um even though we got to the national schools finals, um, played up at Goodison Park, losing that on the, in the final, we we never really got looked at on the island in them stages at, at that time. Um, so I joined the army and uh, joined two days for my 16th birthday and uh, had four and a half great years. And would you think um, it's interesting with the army background? Is it obviously it's incredibly disciplined and um, uh, very structured? Did you, did you think that that helped you uh, when you became a player in terms of your appreciation more of life compared to maybe footballers that have sort of come up and been lauded a bit through academies and stuff? Definitely, 100%. Um, made me realise how lucky I was to have the career that I'd been given. Um, at the time when I um, got out of the army, I was serving in Northern Ireland, so... I was a soldier on the streets, a marksman over there. Um, day to day was was tough, um, hard work, a lot of patrolling, a lot of late nights, a lot of all up through the night, and lots lots of um, stuff going on over there at the time. That was in uh, ninety three to ninety five. I was there, so um, yeah, it was good. Um, but and I wouldn't change it for anything. But at the same time, it gave me all the, I think, appreciation, discipline. Um, all the things you'd expect of a server that can help you as a player and certainly as a manager now found out. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you've also been renowned for your versatility. You've played as a forward, you've played as a fullback, you've been an assistant, a manager. Um, so it seems that it holds no bounds for you. Uh, what, what I presume is the pressure like to be a striker and put the ball in the back of a net or play as a fullback. What, what sort of characteristics do you find crossing over from the army to to football? Where's that served you well? 
Um, I think I uh, just take things on board quite well. You know, how can I cause the centre ask problems? What do they like? What don't they like? And, you know, you always look at that side. And um, <laughs> I fell into the right back area because we were uh, in administration at, at Bournemouth at the time. And uh, Kevin Bond said to me, Radders, can you play right back for me Saturday? And I went, yeah, if I've got a shirt, I'm, I'll play anywhere. Do you know what I mean? And, and that was sort of how it went for me from my career. I actually played everywhere on, on the pitch apart from in goal. You know, in, in league games, I played played centre-half, played full-backs, played centre-mid, on the wing, up front, played everywhere. Um, you know, I think that's that. Going back to the appreciation of I'm getting paid to play football. Um, I didn't spit my dun- dummy out and think, uh, well, I'm the centre-forward. And I just wanted to play and enjoy it and compete and, and win. And the move yeah. to Portsmouth, I mean, that was that was quite a big step for you from non-league football. How did that all come about? What got you noticed, do you think? Um, what it was, Jeff, is we were on pre-season tour at Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight at the time um, for the infantry. And my manager bumped into uh, Terry Fenwick, who you at the time, at Portsmouth. and said, we've got this lad that's been doing well. He scored X amount of goals, playing for the Army in Combined Services. And uh, he said, he'd get me in and have a look. And um, Julie, he did. I came back from Northern Ireland. It was a pre-season, which I didn't know what pre-season was at the time. Um, I just thought training was like that every day. And all the lads were moaning, oh, this is a joke, this is so hard, lads are being sick and everything. I'm thinking, I, I, I couldn't believe what they were moaning about. So I was like, what do you mean? It's not like this all the time. And they were like, no, this is pre-season. This is like six weeks of really hard. And then I thought, oh, this is a bit of me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and from then I got asked to, um, to join them. And uh, uh, I was on pre-season tour at the time in Scotland. And yeah. Um, and then we, we got asked to, sorry, I was in Northern Ireland and they were on the ball and I got asked to join them. So, yeah, and it all went from there. I mean, you hit the ground running at Portsmouth. You had a great, you had a great, um, a great goal scoring record there, which obviously led to the move to Manchester City. I think at the time, um, the figure was quite eye watering, wasn't it, in terms of, uh, in terms of the figure? How does it, how does it, how did the, A, how did the move come about? And B, What's it like having that pressure of a price tag on your shoulders? Because lots of lots of players have had to uh, had to cope with that, some better than others. Yeah. Um, well, the move came about. Obviously, I, when I joined Portsmouth, I was behind Paul and Guy Whittingham, who had a great um, partnership, to be fair, and scored a lot of goals together. Um, but Walsh then got injured, and um, but previously I'd gone on loan to Exeter. And um, I've done reasonably well down there. I think I've got six goals in 13 games, maybe. And um, Walshie got injured, and that's when I got called back to play in the team. And um, from then on, I, I sort of, hit, like you say, hit the ground running a little bit. And uh, after a season, I had interest. And, uh, you know, this lad's come out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, I was I was scoring goals. Um, we had a championship. So, um, yeah, Southampton... Leeds, Man City, uh, quite a few teams came in for me, but I was blown away. The first team I went to was Man City, and Main Road and the size of the club. And um, yeah, moved on from there really. But going on to the, um, it was strange actually, because the first the first game was Portsmouth at home. All right. Oh. And, and to play, I only left like 10 days, two weeks earlier. And, and then I was playing playing against my mates, and um, that was a tough one for me because I had to put, not only was I a three million pound player, the most expensive Man City player that Man City have ever paid for, I was playing against all my friends. And, um, you know, we ended up drawing the game two all, I think, that day, um, which was a fair for me at the time. But yeah. I remember um, Noel Gallagher coming onto the pitch and giving the Pompey fans a load of stick. It was like 90 degrees and he walked up to the, all the Pompey fans and he was, he was goading them. And all the, all the stewards were like, get him off the pitch. <laughs> he is absolutely causing chaos. <laughs> I've seen you all behind you. Is that not, uh, Noel Gallagher behind you on your frame? Uh, it's it's uh, Liam, I think. It might be Noel. I don't know. It's an Liam, old yeah. Okay. Are, to are be you honest, best mate was... the Oasis guys, Lee? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I met him a few times but um, and got their autographs, etc. I was always in awe of him because I was always an Oasis fan. So, um they did look bad as far as gigs are concerned, etc. But um, yeah, it was a great time up there at the time because that was when they were at their biggest, probably in the late nineties. So um, yeah, 
going back to the the fee that they pay for me, I think um, I just wanted to concentrate on the football and what I get judged in. And uh, to be fair, I think it was my seventh game I scored my first goal. And um, each game I could feel the pressure building and building and building. And um, I tried not to let it affect me. Um, But looking back now, it probably did. And when I did score the first goal, the relief, I've got a picture of it, is, was fantastic. But, yeah, it built and built and built. I felt that sort of burden on my shoulder, if you like, to for, to be playing uh, Man City's most expensive player ever. Um, was was a big ask at the time. And as a team and individually, we struggled that year. Um, but it's a great club and it always had the potential to do what it's doing now. Definitely, definitely. And, uh, Lee, after that, you sort of had a little bit of a journeyman uh career until you arrived at obviously at the cherries how did that come about that move where you finally came to us and uh how did you find initially settling in um i was um at south end i was doing a lot of traveling I, I, from oxford to go and join south end and living on the south coast is uh is a bit of a trek up there every day and you know staying up a couple of times a week trying to trying to be as professional as i could but i was away from the family a lot and, um, you know, Kevin Bond, I think that was the link. And they are my own. And my first game was um, Old City. And, um, yeah, and after that, they just asked me, Shay, would I like to become a permanent fixture at the club? And I said, yeah, I mean, I wanted to to be at the club for a couple of years before that. I just thought it, it felt good for me. Obviously, location-wise, it was a good little club. I had a good reputation of playing good football. And, uh, you know, it, it was just right for that time in my career, I think. Those were difficult times, Lee, and as you said earlier, you had to play a multitude of positions because of the administration's difficulties bringing players in and whatever the, the, the restrictions Kevin Bond was under. Um, what was your favourite position? Did you did you prefer striker to right back? Yeah, I did because that's what I've done most of my life was have my back to goal, be the person that can hold the ball up and bring people into play. I mean, I was never really prolific as far as 25 goals a season. I think the best I got was 18 at Portsmouth. So um, I was just a team player, hardworking, battling, old-fashioned number nine, if you like, which are going out of the game now. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I did prefer that. But as time got on, I actually preferred playing right back because the pitch is everything's in front of you. When you get the ball, you've got time. You can see the whole pitch. And if, you, if you're clued up, you can... Um, you can do well with the ball, then you can do well there. And, and I enjoy him a couple of years there, to be fair. Yeah, you always look very, you, you always did look very comfortable at right back, which was because it wasn't a natural move. I remember when we first, you know, sat in the stadium and, and, and you were running out in the right back slot. There were a few puzzled faces amongst the fans, but you it, it, you did really take to it like a, like a duck to water. What was Bondy like um, to, to play for? I enjoyed working with Kevin. Um, obviously he'd been in the shadows of Harry for, for years and uh, probably wanted to have a go at himself and um, being reasonably local, being a Southampton guy, it, it worked quite well. Um, he's very good with the players, Bondi, the lads liked him and uh, I think he got the best out of the players, to be fair. I mean, if we'd won on a Monday morning, we'd go for a run along the beach and have a bacon sandwich, <laughs> which was always nice. And um, he would lead the uh, the run in and, and we'd have a bit of, but we worked hard. Um, but every now and again, he'd, he'd let us let our guard down and play hard. And you obviously worked under Jimmy Quinn. What was that experience like? We've had uh, a few stories about his dog walking ex- uh, exploits. Um, it was different, Jimmy. He joined in a lot in training, to be honest. He was a half player. He could score a goal. Um yeah. I'm not sure what stage in his career he took the job, but um, I think he found it difficult with the uh, with the way the club was at the time and probably didn't see the best of Jimmy Quinn. Um, but what that did do is opened up doors for Jason Tindall and Eddie Howe to, to enter the building and uh, obviously the rest is history from there. And Lee, when you were you were in the in that sort of squad, you were one of those players who had actually a lot of experience. You know, you'd, you'd been around... A number of clubs, and uh, would it be fair to say the players both looked up to you, uh, and also you were one of the the guys who bonded the team together? Yeah, I think um, as a player, I was quite loud and one of the lads, and a bit of a joker, and but also serious and worked hard when I needed to, and led by example. 
Um, I think I've taken that into my my coaching and management style as well. You know, I like it to be a good environment the boys coming into. They've got to enjoy coming in and training and learning and working hard. Um, but at the same same time, it's uh, you can have a bit of fun at the right times. And with myself, Warren Cummins, Danny Ollins, we had so many big characters. Darren Anderton. Um, we had a great, really good group. Um, some good experience in there, but some good young lads as well. And uh, we've done great to stay up with the with the minus points that we had. And actually, if you could see above me here, I've got the um, the minus seventeen shirt and uh, all signed by everyone on the wall. So it, that's something that will always stick with me. One of the things that um, it's probably your, one of your famous YouTube moments is the was the boxing celebration after the goal. I think it was at Grimsby, wasn't it? Um, when you uh, all the players ran up one by one and took a fake punch and landed on the floor. So it, it, that looked like great fun. What was that? What was that all about? It was actually um, Eddie Howe was the manager at the time. And we had a, a Tuesday session and it was something we heard that it was going to be something different. And then we ended up going across the Wessex Way to Boxing Club. I can't remember what the boxing club was called now. And um, we got there and we're all waiting to get out of our cars for the boxing club to be opened. And this big Range, range Rover pulled up and a guy called Scott Welsh got out of it, who was a heavyweight boxer. Don't know if he was a champion, but he was a contender at the time. And he was the guy that Snatch, the film Snatch. He is yep, six foot four, oh. big grizzly beard, and um, a beast of a man. And he took us for a training session. And I'd done some boxing in the army. Um, and uh, we just train in. And he came to the game that day. And I said to him, Scotty, if I score today, I'm going to do a boxing celebration. He said, that would be good. That would give us some PR. So I, I ended up speaking to all the players, and, and that's where I went from. We spoiled it a little bit. It was Darren Ander, and he didn't want to get knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, sorry, we, we, skipped, we skipped over the Eddie bit. I know we'll talk about Eddie a bit more in the, in the, rest, of the rest of the hour we've got. But the, obviously, you'd have played with him, and you'd have seen him as a, uh, a youth team coach on the sidelines. I mean, we were all really surprised mm. when he the job I mean thank god he did did you see anything in him uh, at all that, or were you surprised as well when he took the job yeah I played I played with Eddie at Portsmouth and he was always a quiet unassuming but perfectionist and um, he was very frustrated at Portsmouth because that was the start of his injuries and um, you know there is an element of luck of um, of being in the right place at the right time and I think Eddie had that and um fulfilled his potential and is still doing so to the max and uh, yeah I think Eddie's the type of person that he wants to win absolutely everything you know if he's if he's at the traffic lights he wants to get off first <laughs> you know he's one of those types that um, is a winner and uh, is very organised and uh, enjoys getting one over on opposition managers coaches and uh Rightly so. I think he's fought very high of there. Yes, definitely. And uh, obviously, it's a difficult period. We had the will he, won't he um, be leaving scenario. So, firstly, Eddie was going to look looking to go to the Palace. And he said no. Then he went to Burnley in the end. And you stepped up to the plate. And um, how difficult was that period for, for yourself? And you retired also straight away to concentrate on management. How did you arrive at that decision, Lee? Um, well, it was something that I was a bit like Eddie, looking into what am I going to do next? You know, I've been involved in 16 years and I want to give something back and from Army and that was not something I could transfer to civilian skills. So, um, yeah, I started doing my badges and I think um, that opportunity came around and like I said earlier, there's an element of luck of being in the right place at the right time and... I managed to uh, get a phone call from Eddie Mitchell, the chairman at the time. And I went in and had a, had a chat with him and there was Steve Fletcher there as well. And he said to me, would you want the job? And I said, yeah, 100%. And he said, but what about your playing contract and your playing career? I said, well, I'll give it up now because I want to manage the football club and I want an opportunity to, to get in. And Fletch wanted to carry on playing a little bit. So he was happy to take a bit of more of a backseat and be a 
player coach. And um, and that was it, really. He sort of said, well, give us a couple of games, see how we get on. And I think we beat Brighton, who hadn't lost at the time. Um, and we yeah. we continued to form at the team it had been doing uh, before Eddie left and uh, managed to get the uh, boys into the playoffs. And unfortunately, we lost on penalties against Huddersfield. I remember that Brighton game. That was a, a fantastic performance because Brighton were top of the league, weren't they, at the time? And Glenn Murray was playing for them, as I remember, a, a very young Glenn Murray. Um, yeah. but, I mean, the, you had you had a, a great squad and they, they seemed to all play for each other, that that team. And, um, yeah, I thought um, I thought you did a great job in those first games when you took over. It must have been really difficult, though, wasn't it? It, it was difficult. And, and the transformation, I spoke to lots of friends that have gone from management now and uh, it's different if you get an opportunity at a new club because you can be whoever and whatever you want to be but I've been one of the players I've been their friend I've been the joker um, and now I'm the manager and um, I had to slowly make that transition to head coach manager whatever you want to call it and um, at the same time put my stamp on it with the players let them know that I wasn't to be walked over and that the discipline side of it that I'd learned in the army was key. I think it's key in any job. You have to be disciplined, hardworking, and uh, sort of organised, really, to be successful in anything you do. And um, I think that we tried to transfer that over to boys and uh, the team that played in the uh, playoffs. Got some good players in there that has gone on to play at a good level. Yeah, Danny Ings, in particular, I suppose, was probably the highlight highlight of that side, wasn't he? Um, mm-hmm. The uh, it's, your relationship with Fletch is, is quite interesting because we, as a fan base, we were unsure. We we kind of thought that one of you would get the caretaker role. We weren't quite sure which one it was. I think half the fans thought you know it'd be Fletch, half the fans thought it would be you. Um, was that an easy relationship to settle back down once he decided to be you know once Eddie had decided it was going to be you that did it and Fletch is the number two? Was he always great support, good lad? Yeah, no problem at all. I mean, we had a good relationship. And I think, um, well, you have to in those situations, otherwise it doesn't work, simple as that. If we were at loggerheads, then I think um, we wouldn't have got into the playoffs probably because it would have been, you know, a split uh, management style and and group. And also that, that, that transfers then through to the to the dressing room as well. So um, we managed to, to do it reasonably well together and we used our experience between us. We had a lot of that and uh, nobody sort of, New Bournemouth, like like Fletch did at the time. So, um, no one still um, no one still knows Bournemouth like Fletch. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Keith, go on. I was going to say what is often forgotten. You've also worked alongside people like Harry Arter, Mark Pugh, and Adam Smith, who came in on loan. And uh, did you realise that these guys were going to have the careers that they've gone on to have and uh, and really uh, take their game forward? Did you recognise that at the time? Well, yeah, I mean, I remember taking Adam Smith on loan from Tottenham and um, watching it back, actually, I didn't remember that Smithy played in the playoff game for us at Huddersfield. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until I looked back at him and remembered that. And, uh, yeah, no, he was always a good player, Smithy. You know, he's got good energy, he's quick with the ball. He's um, he's clever. He's got good delivery when he gets in the final third. And, um, yeah, he's a good team player. And um, Pirie was one that, I think I got him the move from um, uh, Hereford because I marked him one day and he was brilliant. <laughs> and All those um, chops yeah, he was, he, was <laughs> he loved the chop and he loved a little Cruyff, but you knew he was going to do it as a player, but you still had to try and stop the cross and then he'd be away from you. And, uh, you know, he's one of those annoying players that you think you know what he's going to do, but he seems to always get the better of you. And, um, you know, he was deceptively quick as well, Pure, small steps and, you know, a couple of quick ones and he was away from you and crossing the ball. So, yeah, he, he was a very good player and I was I was really pleased that he went on and done well because he was a good lad as well. Yeah, and Harry player. Arter, what was, it, what was he like in his early days? Uh, Harry Arter was be the most natural two-footed player I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can, could pass it, could, could score with both feet, had great energy. Um, at the time, he was a little bit frustrated because he wanted to be better. But he grew really fast and he took things on board quickly. 
and he was a player that you could see that would have a good career. You know, he's his passing ability on, on either foot. I, I haven't seen a lot like it in, in recent years. So um, just with learning the game alongside that, which I think the, the spell he was going through when I was playing with um, you, you, once he grasped that, he was going to be a good player. Definitely. And Josh McCoy had that purple patch in that season as well. Um, have you been surprised how his career's turned out? Because he was exceptional. He had that hat trick, of course, and uh, a really skillful player and obviously went on to Millwall and beyond. How do you think he fared at the time? Josh was one of them that he could be anything on the day. He's a little bit under, unpredictable um, to play with and also to um, as, as a manager. He didn't know which Josh was going to turn up in his early days. Um, but he had electric pace and he was direct and he could finish. Um, you know, those things are hard to come by. And that's why I think he was, he got moves to good clubs. And sometimes they aren't for him, but um, he, he had that electric pace and, and that eye for goal, which is very hard to come by. And uh, uh, he went on to do well and he's still playing Brian Stock at, at Weymouth. You know, they've got a, a good little side going on down there as well. That other so, spill game, obviously, we. Um... Uh, we've been talking a lot about it recently because we, this is the first time since then that we've been back in the playoffs. And my my lad was saying about how how much pressure he was feeling last night watching the telly. I said, "Well, just you wait. This this is nothing. Wait till the second leg." The um, what was it like? So obviously, you, you took the group of players. They'd had great form. It, it, the form wasn't as good going into it, it, into the final two games, and then you had to get get the final two games going. What was it? What are your memories of it, and what were the what were the pressures about it? I just remember saying to the players, you know, um, don't put any pressure on yourself. Make sure you just you grab the occasion, and you, the occasion doesn't grab you. You make sure that you you you're in the moment, and you don't let it pass you by. Um, but just relax and play your game and enjoy it, because these situations are hard to come by, and. Uh, but the most important thing was I was trying to take the nerves off of them as well, I think, because we were, I think, so desperate to go up. It can play on on the players' minds at times. I was just trying to talk to them, really, and let them relax and enjoy the game. And they knew what an occasion it was, so I didn't need to add anything more to that. We got a nil-nil, didn't we, in the first leg? And, um, one one Sorry, 1-1. One, one. Yeah, 1-1. One, one. And then we went up there to their place. The atmosphere the atmosphere at Huddersfield was quite intense. I mean, when you watch that game back again, it must still makes their hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And uh, what what was it like to be in that cauldron with such a high-pressure game? It must have been amazing. Yeah, I think I remember, I think it was one older game and we've, um, Dermot ended up getting us a goal. And um, we go up there one up and um, like you say, they'd, I think they'd put... Um, all the football rattled there and it made a hell of an atmosphere and a hell of a noise. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at it then thinking, well, this is what I'll, this is what I'm in it for. These are the games you want to be in it. And I transferred that to the players, you know. These are the games that if you want to play in the championship, in the premiership, the atmospheres that you're going to be in week in and week out. And, uh, you know, embrace it. And uh, I think that was the most important message, to be honest. And we had a good group anyway. They were never say die attitude. And, you know, the, to get 3 all in the game, it was 2 all after full time. And then it went to 3 all. Danny Ings scored a fantastic header. Yeah, um, right. We thought we'd won it, or I certainly did. And then Jason Pierce gets sent off um, probably with 10 minutes to go. And they score last kick of the game to take it to penalties. And you know, how fate has a funny way of, of showing itself sometimes. And, uh, you know, it could have been di oh so different for everyone if... Um, especially myself, if we'd got promoted that, that day in, um, into the yeah, final. You, you mentioned Dermot. Um, there was a, a person who you just thought had the whole world at his feet, didn't you? And it was such a shame it never quite really held a job for him. Yeah. Um, he was somebody that was a bit of a gamble from my perspective. Um, but I knew he, it's a big, a big shout, but, and he obviously didn't have a career like this person, but he reminded me of Gaza. Mm. Yeah, he had that where he could, he could sort of yeah. do the magic out of, out of nothing. You know, looked like it was effortless for him. Um, and then you wouldn't see him again for all sixty minutes, and that that was frustrating because he was a bit of a maverick, really. 
Um, but, you, you know, in games like the playoff game, you, you knew he would pop up with something, and he did in, in, at the home game and scored a cut and inside on his left foot and scored a good goal to make us on his even up up to a Huddersfield. So, um, yeah, it didn't quite happen for him because he had lots of other things going on in his life. could have concentrated solely on his football. He was a hell of a footballer. Yeah, and uh, obviously the defeat came and uh, you had to sell on players and came across a, a, a difficult second season. How how was that? Uh, how did you, first of all, pick yourself up and what what were the issues or the problems that you were facing in terms of club finances and your relationship with Eddie Mitchell? Yeah, I think it's well documented at the time for struggling financially. And um, basically the whole thing was up for sale. And uh, I think we managed to lose seven or eight of the team that got us to the playoffs. We had to sell them. And, uh, you know, I was battling my corner to try and keep him, but I understood the bigger picture as well from the chairman's point of view and the football club. The most important thing is that the club survives and you have another football club the year after. But I feel I was a little bit of a victim of that and uh, to try and rebuild a, a new team. And when you have success, it's very hard to follow in year if you haven't got all them as under contract and um, made, made sign-ins. And we ended up, I think, I think we're mid-table, maybe 12th or 13th when I, when I got the sack. But um, the, the four months before I got the sack was, was quite difficult because... The pressure was on a little bit and uh, I think the relationship between me and Eddie got a little bit um, stretched at times and uh, obviously some of the infamous things he'd done coming on the pitch with a microphone, etc. And into into a, uh, a a news briefing after the game was was a tough one. But we all make mistakes and Eddie would probably be the first one to say that he, he made a couple as well. But, you know, um, me as well. You know, we make mistakes, can't get every sign in right, etc. Um, but I think it's the way you deal with it and apply yourself is the most important quality. Yeah. I think many fans look at your departure as both unfortunate and uh, unnecessary as well, actually. You know, you're right, we were 13th. You'd had a bad run. You know, what was it? Six defeats in eight games was the, the sort of bad run. But but the squad was still mm. decent and we were mid-table. It wasn't like we were plummeting towards relegation or anything. So... Yeah, I mean, what 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 about the um, the the you were succeeded by uh, Groves and Brooks uh, as well? Did you have a good working relationship with them, or or was it was it something that them them stepping up and you staying on just wasn't a possibility? Um, no, I didn't have a good working relationship with them, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've always said honesty is the best policy, and um, you know sometimes that's the way it is. You know, they were in they were in the youth team and. Uh, they were um, doing reasonably well in the youth setup, um, but I just felt that it was uh, there was too much going on behind behind my back, and things were being said around the football club that um, I should have been in control of, but wasn't. And um, again, now having managed for ten years, I would like to have that situation again because obviously I deal a bit differently and a bit more maturely than than I did at the time, but. Um, listen, that's football. You're not going to get on with everyone and not everyone's going to agree. Um, yeah, I just felt that was, uh, they wanted me to stay at the club and work with both of the guys, but I wasn't um, open to that. We, um, obviously, a lot happened after that. Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't stick around um, too long and, and then Eddie came back. So two questions for you, really. You must have been as surprised as the rest of us um, that Bournemouth ended up in the Premier League because I, I still find it hard to believe it. And um, did you take a lot of pride in the, uh, some of the players that you either signed or you developed to work with got there? So were you, were you able to make peace with the fact that you're gone and, and, and enjoy what happened? And, and were you surprised? Um, was I surprised the club got there? Probably, if I'm being honest. Um, but... Um... They had a, you had a hell of a run. And yes, I was able to make peace of it. I only want the club to do well. And, um, you know, and the players and all the people at it, it's life, you move on. And um, I am still in touch with Eddie now and speak to Jason as well. And uh, other other players that have come out of there and are still there coaching in the academies, etc. So um, 
only got fond memories of the club and loved my time there and always have a special place in my heart, Bournemouth. And, uh, you know, both as a player and for getting chance as a coach and manager as well. But um, as far as the players are concerned, um, obviously Steve Cook, who's still playing now. I remember going to watch him playing for Brighton Reserves and signing him thinking, I can't believe, you know, he's, no one's picked him up. He was competitive. He was good on the ball. He was composed. He read the game very well. He's good in the air for somebody that's only six foot. And, um, Simon Francis, I knew and played with at, uh, at South End. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at Charlton at the time, not getting a kick. And um, I just knew that he's a good player. It just needed to give, give a, well an opportunity. And Simon's uh, position was that he just needed confidence back. And if we could get him doing that, I knew he was a Rolls Royce of a player. He absolutely was a fantastic player with the ball and without the ball. And went on to captain a Premier League side. So that was a, a fantastic achievement for him. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Daniels as well. Played against him a lot and uh, always liked him. He had good balance, good left foot, could score a goal. Yeah. Had good energy and would, would get round the winger once he came inside onto his right foot if he inverted wingers. And uh, would give you that option going forwards as well. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of them, them boys and Alan and, uh, you know, to have a small piece of the history um, is pleasing for me. Oh, de definitely, uh, Lee. And uh, I think in much in the same way as Kevin Bond uh, was instrumental in putting the foundations in place for the club when he was the manager, I think, I think that's much the same for you. And uh, I think a lot of Bournemouth fans, newer Bournemouth fans, don't realise how much of an instrumental part you played in our journey. Mm -hmm. um, you must be very proud of, as I say, that legacy you've left behind. But you did move on. You were stepped down to Haven and Waterlooville. Uh, how was that as a challenge and working with maybe lesser players? Yeah, it was a tough challenge. In between, I had a bit of Portsmouth working in the uh, under-16s there for six months or so. Um, and then this job came around. It's sort of 20 minutes at the road for me. Of course, I wanted to get back into league football. Um, but uh, opportunities were sort of thin at the time. And I was just wanting to learn and get on the grass and coach and continue, you know, sort of my development, really, as far as coaching and managing. And uh, I took the opportunity to, to do that down at Haven. And uh, again, seven years there, always have good memories. And you know, got to the semi-finals, got two promotions in it. Well, won the league two years, and won two managers of the year, two years in a row, and and managed to sort of really sort of learn and develop. And it done a great job for me at that time. You know, and a lot of ex Bournemouth players, Portsmouth players, etc., played for me, and we had a really good uh, little setup there. And uh, you know, it's just unfortunate when we did get to the national league, the club wasn't ready for financially, and uh, it was a tough ask that season. Did you learn a lot from Eddie or who would you say was the most influential coach on your career as a coach? I was quite fortunate. I had some very good managers, coaches, Steve Koppel, Terry Venables, Terry Fennick, you know, um, Tony Pulis, Harry Redknapp, Joe Royal. You know, I could go on. And uh, I think you, you learn a lot of the bad things they do and think I'm not going to do that if I'm ever going to be a manager or a coach. But also, you um, you pick up good things and think, I like that. The way he's dealt with that is good. And, you know, the way he is with the players or the way he takes the training session and then carries himself, um, you can learn from all those things. But you don't really start to look at that until I think you're about 28, 29 and start to take things on board. Um, but being around good managers, good coaches is the most important thing. And that's the coaching badges that you do with the FA, all the sessions they do and all the content they give you is great but the most important things is getting information off of good coaches good ex-pros and managers that can pass on um, golden nuggets really Dick, talking about um former managers as well i was just thinking you said you were still you still in touch with jason tindall do you see a lot of parallels with him his career as a manager at bournemouth and your career as a manager at bournemouth in terms of very similar circumstances aren't they yeah, probably are, to be honest. I mean, whoever followed Eddie was going to have a very, very tough job on their hands. Um, the only way that you could be successful after Eddie was continuing to compete 
uh, to get into the Premier League and stay in the Premier League. Um, you know, and things change at clubs, you know, uh, budgets, etc. And Jason was a little bit susceptible to that as well, probably. Once, once Eddie had left, I think it had a bit of a downturn as far as... He was a big part of the furniture, Eddie, there for years. And, and to leave was a big wrench, I think, both for him and for the fans. And it took a bit of its toll, I think. And Jason probably was a little bit of the uh, the scapegoat as far as uh, uh, losing his job pretty soon after that. Do you think um, Eddie should go to Celtic? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think um, it's a fresh outlook for him. Up there, I think it's a massive club. And, um, you know, you look at people like Brendan Rodgers, gone up there, been very successful, come back into the Premier League and and smashed it. And uh, I think Eddie, no matter where he goes, if he's given the chance financially to be successful, he will be. And um, I think he will have uh, a great time up in Scotland. It will give him, give him a fresh start to be able to implement his own ideas and, and ways in and around Celtic, which is an absolutely huge club. Yeah, and uh, so you went on to Eastbourne Borough and uh, another long league club, but you weren't there very long and you obviously uh, were invited to coach at Crawley, a, a club I know. I used to live in the area. Um, how, no. how did you get that job and um, how did that all come about? Um, what it was, was uh, the Eastbourne one was, was one that... Um, they had fresh investment and uh, I was going to go down there and, you know, hopefully we're going to get the team promoted. But um, the investment wasn't secured. And um, a couple of months into the season, um, the investor um, pulled out and I wasn't willing to stay in under those circumstances. So I ended up leaving the club. Um, financially, they were struggling. And uh, and then the, the, the role came along at, um, at Crawley with uh, another... Bournemouth, uh, ex Bournemouth staff member in John Yems, who is with Eddie and Jason for I think, five years down at the club and uh, had a great time down there bringing in a lot of players and helping the club. Um, so, therefore, it's um, it was an opportunity for me to be assistant manager, something I've never been before, but one that I relished and uh, it was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. And there was a, a bit of a cup tie this season, Crawley Town against AFC Bournemouth. How was that for you? It was strange coming back, actually. Um, you know, from a, I've only been back once, I think, since since I left because um, obviously I've been been in sort of work since. Um, one of the games, the only game I come to was a Man United game at home, and um, Jeff, uh, the chairman, has always been a couple of tickets for me to bring my son. Very excited about the fact we could sit in the. Um, up in the boardroom and uh, be around the Man United players and stuff after the game. So, um, yeah, it was um, nice to come back. But a cup tie was always going to be a tough game. You know, we'd done great to beat to beat Leeds. And uh, we beat Wimbledon before that and Torquay in the 6-5 game away at Torquay. Um, I think, to be honest, Bournemouth cruised through that night. You know, they didn't really have to get a second and uh, had a lot of the ball. And, and uh, you know, having said that, we... We could have scored another goal to take it to two all, and you know you never know from there. But um, no, the players that you you had in the squad that night was uh, more than to beat us, and uh, we're just thankful it wasn't an embarrassing night from our behalf. So, final question in terms of um, Bournemouth. So, did you watch the player? Because obviously Gary O'Neill. I was thinking you probably knew Gary O'Neill from your Pompey days. Did you? Did you watch the game uh, last uh, against Brentford? And how do you think we'll cope over the two legs? Yeah, Gary O'Neill's a very good friend of mine. Um, golfing, golfing friends, if you like, and have, have been for years. Um, you know, and Gary's done excellent um, getting his pro licence and that and going up, up to Liverpool and sort of um, starting his journey there. And I think the draw of Bournemouth was one he couldn't turn down. And, uh, you know, to be involved in first-team football in such a such a good level for his first job was a great attraction. And I'm sure Gary and Woody uh, and Perchie will all, all do very well together there. Um, in the game, I think it was a very even game. You know, they missed a good chance, Brentford. A good football inside. Um, that I think will go to the wire with Bournemouth um, in the next game. And, uh, you know, hopefully they can um, use their counter-attacking pace that they've got 
um, away at Brentford because I'm sure that'll be probably the the idea that they're going to be hard to play against, protect what they've got, but also counter attack and be a threat. And you know, the first goal is going to be of all importance in the next game. Can you can you let Gary O'Neill know that if it goes to penalties at their place, that we can choose which end we choose, we we play the penalties at? You can do that now, can you? I believe so. Yeah, I know it was something that got sort of forced upon you at Huddersfield, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did. So that was before the game. The safety um, officer, we had a meeting, and he said, if there is uh, a penalty shootout, we'll toss a coin unless there's any safety um, issues. And then at the end of extra time, he pulled me and uh, I actually pulled the two captains together and um, said that they're going to do it in front of the Huddersfield end because there's Bournemouth, uh, Huddersfield fans in the Bournemouth end. And I said, well, they haven't done their job properly then. Why should we, as a club, get punished for Huddersfield Town Football Club letting fans in the away end? So that's not my fault. And they said, well, we, we can't address that now. All we, can, all we can do is take it the other end because we know there's just Huddersfield fans there. And it was a disadvantage. We missed two penalties. And uh, after that, obviously, the rest is history. But, you know, those little things, they do count. And uh, that's why it's important that everything's got to be done well. I think all we can console ourselves with is the fact that Huddersfield got stuffed in the final. So, you know. Yeah. What, exactly. What, uh... <laughs> What, what are Gary O'Neill's qualities? It's interesting that you know him well because we know very little about him. Obviously, most, most of our coaches we know because they, they've been a the player at our club because Bournemouth is one of those <laughs> yeah. clubs. So, so what's, what's Gary O'Neill's qualities and, and what do you think role Joe Jordan plays? Because you all know Joe Jordan as well from your Portsmouth days. So what, how, how do you see those two working? Um, I think Gary is um, very forward-thinking. Very um, organised, uh, good with the players. Has got good experience as far as I think he's been promoted out of the championship four times. Um, you know he's been there, seen it, and done it as far as getting from the championship to the Premier League numerous occasions. And um, he's been at big clubs. He's worked with Gareth Southgate at, at Middlesbrough. Um, he's been around good people all his career. So um, that can only have a positive impact on you. And, uh, I think Joe will be um, the voice of reason, if you like, looking at the bigger picture. Again, having experienced it as a manager and a coach, he will sort of try to guide the younger ones. And, uh, you know, it's collectively, I'm sure they're trying to make a decision and, and Jonathan will have the final say. And, uh, you know, I really hope and pray Bournemouth can do it again this year to get back into Premier League where they belong. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, uh, Lee, what's the future hold for you mate where where do you you're obviously happy at Crawley at the moment but where do you want to take your career well I think uh you know I want to get back into management at some stage I want to get back into the league and and manage and coach and as high as I can obviously that's what everybody aspires to do in any walk of life you want to be the best and and be at the against the best and uh, I think that's something that is a challenge in something that I do thrive to do. So uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, given time, uh, I can I can find myself back up my legs. Fantastic. Well, look, Lee, thanks so much for giving us an hour of your time today. It's been brilliant talking with you. And uh, I don't think we could have picked a better week to have a conversation with you. You know, we're all, we're all buzzing after last night. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be buzzing Saturday lunchtime too. Yeah, hopefully I'll be watching it with uh, bated breath and... Uh, Thank you, everyone, and good luck to everybody and up the cherries. Thanks so Thank much. You, Lee. Really good, really good. And, um, yeah, thanks for joining us here on Back of the Night. It's been a pleasure to have your, your company. Thanks also to everyone watching and commenting during the show today. If you want to watch more Cherries interviews, then do make sure you check out the interviews playlist being shown at the top of your screen now. Also, do remember to like this video, give us a subscribe, and if you're looking for more AFCB content, then you know where to go. It's back of the net. Right. Neil, thank you very much. Great thank to you. have you on the show too. Yeah, always good to be here. Always, always great to talk to great old people that have been part of the club as well. I don't think Brad thinks he's that old, you know, Neil. Yes, old. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith, thanks, thanks for coming on. Really good. And uh, I like the total football shirt. That's what we saw last night. Let's have more of that on Saturday, eh? All for Arnie and, uh, yeah, 
I'm so thrilled to uh, speak to you, Lee, and working with you guys. Really, really enjoyed Thanks, Keith. Thank you. And thanks for well, being home. Take care. Yeah, thank you, Lee, and uh, see you on the next video. Up the cherries.